chance becomes a sort of providence, which, under the cover of atheism, is not named, but which is secretly worshipped. These words belong to the famous zoologist Pierre-Paul Grasset, former president of the French Academy of Sciences, and himself an evolutionist, and summarize how evolutionists adopt the concept of chance as their god. According to the theory of evolution, life was born entirely through natural causes and by chance and developed at random. In other words, evolutionists regard chance as divine and claim that it is so rational, conscious, and powerful as to be able to create all the senses and living things in the universe. In their view, the universe we live in, furnished with countless delicate balances, millions of different species of living things, and their structures that possess exceedingly complex structures and features, all came into being as the result of chance. The fact is, however, that today such scientific fields as biology, paleontology, genetics, biochemistry, and microbiology have proven that life could never in any way come into being by itself as the result of chance and natural conditions. That is because just one single living cell is a great miracle of creation that is sufficient on its own to entirely invalidate the concept of chance. This superior creation in living things, one of the proofs that they were created by God, Lord of superior wisdom and infinite knowledge. During the course of this film, we shall be seeing how the flawless balances in the universe and the miraculous structures in living things totally invalidate the idea of life having come into being by chance. We shall also witness how evolutionists have entered the blind alley of chance in order to avoid admitting the evident truth of the existence of God. Just think about the things you see from the moment you wake up in the morning. The mirror you look into every morning. The keys that open your car door. The traffic lights along the way. The billboards, cars. Spend some time to consider, and it will no doubt occur to you that each of these things was produced for a special purpose. No one would say that it was a matter of chance that everything was where it should be when you arose up in the morning. That is because, with the exceedingly complex details they possess, every one of them is an example of special design. The people you see walking along the street, or the trees you pass by, the dog that runs out in front of you, the flowers, the sky above you, could their existence be by chance, do you think? Everyone who thinks with their reason and conscience, without being swayed by any preconception, will immediately realize that living things and human beings cannot be the work of chance. They will understand that it is the omniscient God who creates all living things. In all ages, however, there have been people who failed to see this clear reality, or rather who saw it, but ignored it. These people sometimes emerge as professors, researchers, or paleontologists behind them. They claim that trees, birds, clouds, houses, you, yourself, others around you, in short, 
and in the universe. And inanimate is all the work of blind chance. In the same way that people all through history have so lost all rationality as to be able to regard totems and the statues they carved with their own hands as divine and think that statues made of mud could possess creative power, these people who regard chance as a divine entity are in exactly the same position. God refers to these people in the Quran thus, He to whom the kingdom of the heavens and the earth belongs. He does not have a son, and he has no partner in the kingdom. He created everything and determined it most exactly. But they have adopted gods apart from him, which do not create anything, but are themselves created. They have no power to harm or help themselves. They have no power over death, or life, or resurrection. According to evolutionists' totally imaginary claims, in the wake of the explosion known as the Bing, atoms in some way managed to create themselves in a very sensitive equilibrium. Some of the atoms that spread out at random came together by chance and formed the stars and planets in space, while others formed our Earth. Some of the atoms that formed our planet initially formed the soil on it and later suddenly decided to form living things. These atoms first turned into cells with complex structures and these then multiplied by dividing into two and began to speak and hear. Rather than simply combining to constitute a dark mass, atoms such as carbon, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, and iron came together to form perfect brains of an extraordinary complexity, the secrets of which have not been fully fathomed even today. These brains began to see three-dimensional images of a quality far exceeding any technology today. These atoms then turned into university professors, studied themselves under electron microscopes, and claimed that they had come into being by chance. That, in essence, is the theory of evolution. Despite the illogical nature of these claims of chance, in the last 150 years, from scientists to professors, from doctors to researchers, have believed in this irrational and illogical theory. Let us now examine this claim by means of a very simple but easily comprehensible and convincing experiment in order to provide the necessary reply to evolutionists' imaginary scenario. Let anyone who believes in the creative power of chance events take a large barrel. Let them put into it however much material they believe is required to form a living thing. For example, let them include all the needed elements, carbon, phosphorus, calcium. Let them go even further and place amino acids and proteins, not one of which could possibly have come into being by chance, into this barrel. Then let them subject this mixture to all kinds of external influences. For example, heat or chill the barrel. Let it be struck by lightning or apply electric current. Let them whatever devices they choose for as long as they choose at whatever speed they choose. In addition, let them stand guard on this barrel, transferring this responsibility from father to son. 
Let them consult with others. Meet with the world's foremost biologists, geneticists, physicists, and experts on evolution. The result will never be any different. Despite conscious effort, they'll never be able to produce anything like a living being in that barrel. No matter what they do, they'll never be able to produce the wide variety of birds, multicolored fish, rabbits, horses, or other animals from inside that barrel. Despite their all growing in the same soil and being watered with the same water, they can never produce fruits, which all taste so very different to one another. Let those atoms in that barrel perform any reactions they want. Never will they produce brilliant scientists like Einstein and Newton able to solve complex problems. Artists like Michelangelo and Picasso able to create masterpieces Musicians like Beethoven and Mozart able to compose melodies to delight the human spirit. Discoverers, scientists able to examine under electron microscopes the molecules and atoms out of which they themselves are composed. Or consider those able to design automobiles and write books. Thinkers with faculties of logic and judgment. Human beings able to retain in memory what they have learned share longings, feel excitement and pleasure, who are possessed with a sense of love, mercy, and compassion, who enjoy the taste of food, and who can defend an idea. If so, if no living thing can ever be produced by human pool of human knowledge, how can life be brought into being with the aid of unconscious atoms and chance events? All the positive sciences of the 20th century very clearly, definitively, and irrefutably proved that not a single living cell can be produced in the laboratory by bringing inanimate substances together, let alone by chance. If life exists, then it must have a creator. Even if billions of inanimate substances come together, they can never come alive by themselves or possess consciousness. It is God with his superior intellect, infinite knowledge, and matchless power who creates all these entities. Your Lord is God, who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then settled himself firmly on the throne. He covers the day with the night, each pursuing the other urgently. And the sun and the moon and stars are subservient to his command. Both creation and command belong to him. Blessed be God, the Lord of all the worlds. The formation of the universe and its rate of expansion, the location of the earth in the Milky Way, the kind of light emitted by the sun, the viscosity of water, the levels of the gases in the atmosphere, and a great many other systems with their extraordinarily delicate balances show that the universe very definitely cannot be the product of chance. Every planet in the universe, large and small, is the critically important part of a larger order. Not one of their positions in space or any of their movements is random. On the contrary, their countless details known to us so far have been created and especially adjusted for a particular purpose. Of all the innumerable factors influencing the balances in the universe, a change in the position of just one planet is enough to bring chaos. 
But these balances are never upset. The universe continues on, in its perfect order, with no problems. All of this is a result of God's supreme power in creation. He who created the seven heavens in layers, you will not find any flaw in the creation of the all-merciful. Look again. Do you see any gaps? Then look again and again. Your sight will return to you, dazzled and exhausted. The universe's perfect structure led even Charles Darwin the architect of the theory of evolution, to admit that there is no room for chance in its creation. As he wrote, This conviction in the existence of God follows from the extreme difficulty, or rather impossibility, of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man with his capacity of looking far backwards and far into futurity as the result of blind chance or necessity. Another vitally important balance in the universe is the distance between the moon and the earth. That distance is of the greatest importance to the survival of life on earth and in terms of the maintenance of many other balances. Indeed, the slightest variation in the distance between the two bodies could give rise to significant imbalances. For example, if the moon were much closer to the Earth, it would crash into our planet. If much farther away, it would move off into space. If it were much closer, the tides that the moon causes on the Earth would become dangerously larger. Ocean waves would sweep across low-lying sections of the continents. A more distant moon would reduce tidal action, making the oceans more sluggish. Stagnant water would endanger marine life, yet it is that very marine life that produces the oxygen that we breathe. That could lead to the disappearance of all life. The distribution of heavenly bodies in the universe is created exactly to conform to the needs of human life. These distances directly affect the orbits and even the existence of the planets. The distribution of the heavenly bodies in space and the huge empty spaces between them are essential to life on Earth. In his book, The Symbiotic Universe, American astronomer George Greenstein explains the importance of the distances between heavenly bodies. Had the stars been somewhat closer, astrophysics would not have been so very different. The fundamental physical processes occurring within stars, nebulas, and the like would have proceeded unchanged. The appearance of our galaxy as seen from some far distant vantage point would have been the same. About the only difference would have been the view of the which would have been yet richer with stars. And oh yes, one more small change. There would have been no me to do the viewing. All these facts show that there are perfect systems in the universe, consisting of most delicate balances that are essential for life. There can be no doubt that these cannot be the work of an order established by chance or unconscious atoms. The entire universe is full of evidence of the matchless knowledge and infinite might of God, the Lord of the worlds. In the Quran, God reveals that
God, there is no God but him, the living, the self-sustaining. He is not subject to drowsiness or sleep. And the earth belongs to him. Who can intercede with him except by his? He knows what is before them and what is behind them, but they cannot grasp any of his knowledge save what he wills. His footstool encompasses the heavens and the earth and their He is the Most High, the Magnificent. Flowers are such sweet-smelling natural wonders. Fruits offer their wonderful flavors and catches of vitamins. Trees supply oxygen for living things. These are among the wonderful blessings that God has given to human beings. They are too beautiful, have systems too complex, and advantages too indispensable for them to be in the least attributable to chance. The tiny seeds you see contain 60 times more information than in all of the Encyclopedia Britannica. When planted in the ground, the information in the seed will later turn it into a flower or a tree. From every seed emerges a plant different in taste, smell, color, and size than every other. Together, black soil and a small seed can produce colorful flowers, sweet-smelling aromas, and perfumed fruits. That is just one of the creative miracles of Almighty God. In the Quran, God says, Have you thought about what you cultivate? Is it you who make it germinate, or are we the germinator? If we wished, we could have made it broken stubble. You would. For millions of years, the countless varied plants on Earth have known what they must do. Program, and they remember this program and carry it out without error. A peach tree never grows from a cherry pit, nor does a straw from the seed from a lemon tree. It is surely impossible for a piece of wood, with no brain, eyes, or intelligence, to put such a perfectly working program into operation by itself. The idea that this system can have been functioning perfectly for millions of years due to the success of chance occurrences is a fantasy that all senses find ridiculous. It is God who creates plants. This fact is revealed in the Quran. It is he who sends down water from the sky, from which we bring forth growth of every kind. And from that we bring forth the green shoots, and from them we bring forth close-packed seeds, and from the spathes of the date palm date clusters hanging down, and gardens of grapes and olives and pomegranates, both similar and dissimilar. Look at their fruits as they bear fruit and ripen. There are signs in that for people who believe.
millions of living things, each one of which is equipped with the most appropriate systems for its environment, the most appropriate for its needs. Some are born with powerful muscles, others with highly sensitive ears, some with eyes created to see with enormous clarity underwater, and others with bodies able to withstand the longest of journeys. So, who gave them the information they needed to prepare themselves for an environment they have never yet seen? How does a newborn land animal know that it needs lungs to be able to utilize the oxygen in the atmosphere? Or that a fish anticipate that it will need gills to use the oxygen dissolved in the water it swims in? How can birds realize they need lightweight skeletons in order to fly? that sea-going penguins need feathers coated in oil so as not to absorb water, that eagles need sharp eyes to see their prey from thousands of meters above the ground, that a woodpecker needs a special suspension system to protect its head from serious concussion. How could chance and unconscious atoms have created living things, those marvels of creation with such perfect features? Such a thing is, of course, completely impossible. It is God, the Lord of the worlds, who created living things with their marvelous systems, together with the favorable conditions that allow every living thing in the universe to grow and thrive. Professor Gary E. Parker was formerly an evolutionist, but like many other scientists, on the basis of research he did in paleontology and biology, he came to the conclusion that the theory of evolution was invalid. Here, he reveals his true thoughts about the variety of species. What spectacular variety we see among living things, both variation within kind and the stupendous number of different kinds. Most of us are awed by the spectacular variation in color, size, form, features, and function we see both within and among the incredible diversity of living things that grace our planet. Why so much variation? Darwin himself described the anxiety he experienced upon seeing the perfection in animals that invalidated his theory. I remember well the time when the thought of the amazingly complex structure of the eye made me cold all over. But I have got over this stage of complaint, and now trifling particulars of structure often make me very uncomfortable. The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Peacock feathers that made Darwin sick as he looked at them, and all the marvels in animals, plants, and nature are all proofs of creation by means of which we can comprehend the might of God, who created everything from nothing, and by which we can properly appreciate his power. God draws our attention to this fact in the Quran. And the earth how we stretched it out and cast firmly embedded mountains onto it, and caused luxuriant plants of every kind to grow in it, an insight and a reminder for every human being who willingly turns to God. The theory of evolution's claims are too obviously illogical to need discussion.
They are as nonsensical as the assertion that skyscrapers in the middle of a city came about by chance, arising from the stones and other debris left by a rainstorm. Evolutionists encounter a major difficulty in putting forward these claims, which are based upon no scientific findings whatsoever. Accounting for the human soul, evolutionists cannot explain in the least how it happens that lifeless matter can bring about a thinking human being, able to enjoy himself and laugh, one able to experience sorrow and excitement, one who can produce works of art, compose music, feel pleasure at hearing a favorite song played, enjoy the smell and taste of food, who can be a good friend, make discoveries, administer a government and travel into space. That is, these properties are the result of man having been endowed with a soul by God. Human beings are intelligent and willful beings into whom God breathed his spirit. This truth has been revealed in the verses of the Quran. He who has created all things in the best possible way, he commenced the creation of man from clay then produced his seed from an extract of base fluid, then formed him and breathed his spirit into him and gave you hearing, sight, and hearts. What little thanks you show. About seven billion people live in the world. The majority of these people have perfect vision systems and perfect hearing systems. The human visual system is so developed that no camera produced with the latest technology can the quality of image that the human eye can afford. The human ear is more advanced than the most modern sound system. But Darwinists believe that these visual and sound systems, which the most advanced technology cannot even approach, are the products of blind chance. Of course these claims are exceedingly irrational. Darwinism's aim is to cause people to deny the manifest and certain fact of creation. There is absolutely no doubt that lifeless, unconscious atoms cannot think. They are ignorant of physical laws and cannot make mathematical calculations. They cannot become engineers who construct dams that restrain tons of water or huge skyscrapers. They cannot use a computer, play the piano, or compose pleasant music. Darwinism is a blindness more serious and incomprehensible than the ancient Egyptians' belief in the sun god Ra, the totems of some African tribes, the sun worship of the Sabians, the handmade idols of the people of Abraham and the worship of the golden calf by the children of Israel. This is the lack of intelligence that God points out in the Quran. In several verses, he says that some people will have their judgment clouded and fall into such a wretched state as to be unable to see the truth. Some of them listen to you, but we have placed covers on their hearts, preventing them from understanding it, and heaviness in their ears. Though they see every sign, they still have no belief. When we look at a picture, we know that it is the work of a conscious, capable, experienced, and knowledgeable painter. Even if we do not see the painter, we still have no doubts as to his existence. Nobody can possibly maintain that the picture came into being as a result of paint being accidentally spilt onto the canvas. Someone who likes these pictures directs his praise and appreciation not to the paintings themselves, but to their architect, 
the painter who made them. All the beauties we see around us belong to God, their creator. Only God, the incomparable creator of all, is deserving of praise and thanks. People who believe in the most illusory and unscientific claims of evolution under their scientific mask, who devote their lives to defending those claims, will be humiliated when the truth is finally revealed. Indeed, the American writer Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a proponent of evolution and atheism for many years before realizing his error and becoming a believer, says, I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books in the future. Posterity will marvel that so very flimsily and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. This day is not far off, in fact, it's quite near. When people will understand that chance is not a god and realize that the theory of evolution has been the biggest deception casting a most powerful spell. That is because the truth of creation is evident. As stated in the Quran, it is Almighty God who gives human beings all they possess and who creates the universe in which we live. What a person must do, therefore, is to know God, the creator of all, and to give thanks to him. Say, who provides for you out of heaven and earth? Who controls hearing and sight? Who brings forth the living from the dead and the dead from the living? Who directs the whole affair? They will say, God. Say, so will you not guard against evil? That is God, your Lord, the truth. And what is there after truth except misguidance? So how have you been distracted? 